I'm going to start by kind of, a, in a way, disappointing you a little bit about crowded stand because I think many of you guys, unfortunately, will not be doing crowded stand because of privileges um, issues. I mean, I know we're very particular about it in our institution. So what I've done, part of it not because we don't have the volume. Even here, we, we, we the volume went down because we don't, we're not doing as many crowded standing as we used to do in the past. Uh, but also, uh, you know, the volume, the volume overall is down. So what I've do, what I've done is actually I work very closely with one of the neurointerventional radiologists. Uh, so this way, and I go down work with him. He comes up, he, he does cases with me. So this way, we can both kind of keep our numbers. Uh, I mean, for them, it's not an issue because they're working in the brain all the time. But for me, it's mainly it's more for me. And also, I learned a lot from them. These guys are technically unbelievable uh, people, neurointerventional radiologists. So I, I recommend you guys do the same work with them and um, um, I learn with them. The other thing that helped is actually I had some of my partners drop their cardiac stand. They don't want to do it. They were just keep doing open, you know, CA. So, so that also brought up my endo, endo numbers a little bit. So, uh, so again, I'm, I'm not going to basically go through some of the studies, uh, but you heard about the, you know, even though they're old, but they're the great studies, uh, NASA at ACAS, but as you can see, the exclusions were not just there are multiple, it could be surgical history exclusion, it could be comorbidities exclusion, age, uh, symptoms and lesions, so obviously we need an alternative. I think carotid stand is a great alternative to some of the patients uh, that we see. Uh, minimally, you know, obviously, it's minimally invasive, patient awake. Uh, sometimes we do, we put them to sleep, depending on the complexity of the, either the lesion or the patient, if they can tolerate uh, sitting um, on the bed for a while. And uh, no incisions, they pretty much go home the next day. You know, no cranial nerve injury, even though it's been reported, believe it or not, after carotid stenting. Um, and also the main um, the difference is less risk of cardiac uh, event. Uh, real quick, you're going to see a lot of studies. Actually, a lot of studies initially came out was industry sponsored. So I really cautious you guys to look at some of the studies, especially the initial ones where a lot of them were industry sponsored. Actually, a lot of them were not even peer re peer reviewed or published. So be careful when you look at them. So Sapphire is also one of the uh, uh, industry sponsored trials. Um, was again not inferior inferiority trial, but again these are unacceptable risks. You know, 12% composite. Uh, cardiovascular risks, you know, uh, and then basically showed that coronary artery stent is not inferior to CA. Um, uh, the multiple studies that came out, these are for symptomatic trials. Um, you know, I recommend you guys go over the EVA3, uh, EVA S, uh, 3S uh, trial, which was actually had to be also terminated because patient, well, there were high incidence of stroke, uh, stroke and death in the, um, the coronary stent, so they had to be terminated. There was a lot of criticisms about that trial. Um, you know, there was no standard you know, filter used or techniques. So that was one of the criticism. Uh, but again, if you look at the uh, some of the other ones like the space and the ICSS, kind of almost similar results. Maybe higher higher incidence of uh, 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 stroke death and MI with the carotid artery stent. Um, but uh, the ones that you should be familiar with uh, with is the CREST trial, um, and now we have another one with a medical arm in. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to take because I mean these are huge numbers. Uh, but again, if you look at the composite endpoint, MI and de death and stroke, it was actually similar between the carotid stand and the CA. Uh, and that's because, you know, the CA had higher incidence of um, uh, MI because, you know, you kind of factor the general seizure into it. And then meanwhile, the carotid stand had a higher incidence of stroke. So, you know, I guess you pick your battle. Is it better to have an MI or stroke? I mean, there's actually there's some, some studies done, what we call ad hoc studies done to see if you have an MI, you actually have, uh, you know, or, or stroke, which one will patient will do worsely over time. So, but basically, you know, uh, they're, they're, you know, similar, similar uh, uh, outcomes. Each one has a different problem, but. Um, so I'm just going to, just for sake of time, just go to the technical aspect of it. Um, so the majority of the lesions that we see are at the bifurcation. Again, what uh, Dr. Hyde was saying, the majority of those are embolic that you see. Actually, I have three patients. I should, should have brought the images. I have a couple of patients actually with, tot with bilateral ICA occlusion, and they're totally fine. They're living with just, you know, both ICAs. And I'm not talking congenital absence of the ICA. These are actually two totally occluded ICAs. So... Uh, so it's not a usually hemodynamic issue. It's more like a, um, you know, an embolic issue. Uh, so there's different types of uh, occlusions or filters uh, that we you know we don't really use the Medtronic Perk Search um, uh, anymore. Uh, most most people use either filter or now we have the reversal flow. Uh, I'm actually getting trained on the Silk Road. Um, you know, again, it's one of those things that you get comfortable with the filter. You're comfortable with the certain wires and catheters. Now something new comes along, and you kind of want to refine your technique a little bit. 
Um, so again, uh, we all, you know, I'm sure that your attendees always ask you, show you an arch, is this a type one, two or three? I mean, one way of doing it is just throw, draw a, two parallel lines on the inner outer curve and look at the origin of the vessels and see if it's a type one, two or three. Um, obviously a type three is a more difficult to cannulate. Uh, it's good to know that so you can choose your catheters and wires. Um, and again, that's important because the longer studies, all the studies have shown that the longer you're in there, the operation, the, the more manipulation, the higher incidence of stroke. So again, knowing that ahead of time, knowing what to choose to minimize all these risks is very, very important. Um, Different stents we use, majority, obviously, uh, we use self-expanding in the carotid, and the reason, you know, Dr. Silva talked about if you get choked, you know, by your wife or, or, or husband, for whatever reasons, hopefully the self-expanding will re-expand. Um, um, and, um, and then also, there's, we have a closed cell versus open cell. I, I'm pretty much use a uh, closed cell, but the only time you want to use an open cell, especially like in tortuous ICAs, or sometimes when you come from the arm, if you don't have access, sometimes it's, it, it tra the uh, open cell uh, uh, tracks better. So, uh, so it might be easier coming from the arm to go up into the ICA to deploy it. Uh, tapered versus non-tapered, there's some evidence show that tapered have a lower rate of restenosis. Uh, but again, I, mean, I, I, I usually use both, uh, so, um, and there's a um, covered and not covered, but we're still in the early stages. I know the, um, there's now a cover stent with a very thin PTFE to allow flow through the external, uh, but it's still, it's not, not on the market yet. So, uh, uh, again, I, you know, karate standing, you know, um, if you're going to start doing those, I recommend the first, I don't know how many you do, maybe do them, do them with your senior partner or something, because, I mean, you want to get some good results, you want to start with some bad results. Uh, so, but uh, basically, you want to make sure you have femoral access. Like I said, it can be done from the arm, it's not easy. Uh, you want to do, do arch angiogram. I usually, if I have a CTA, actually, I don't do an arch angiogram anymore. I kind of, um, you know, look at the uh, CTA, kind of know where the vessels are and try to access them. Um, yeah, so you want to basically put a wire, eventually the catheter in the common carotid, you take pictures, you want to look at the cerebral, uh, uh, cervical uh, circulation of the carotid, you want to look at the intracerebral circulation, and different views, you want to do pre and post to make sure that you didn't um, uh, embolize. Uh, then you put your stiff wire in the external, over that stiff wire you advance your sheath, and now, and usually when your sheath just above the clavicle, and then when you're doing the procedure, you want to see a few things. You want to see the jaw, you want to see the sheath, so that because sometimes as you're going up, because once your sheath is up, now you're relying on the filter, right? Initially, you put your sheath off on a stiff wire, right, 035. And now you have a filter wire, which is an 014 wire. So you want to make sure, because uh, trust me, it happened, it happened to me. Um, you know, we finished. We, luckily, we was the end of the case. We put the stand, we ballooned, and I realized the sheath was already down in the, in the, uh, in the ascending, and now you have filter wire. So I had to, luckily, was able to pass a uh, quick cross and kind of recapture the, uh, the filter. So you, so you want to see, so you want to see the tip of the filter in your picture, you want to see the jaw, and basically you want to see also the, uh, the, the, the filter, if you can, also in the, in the picture. So when you're doing the procedure, and I have some pictures of those. Uh, I don't pre-dilate anymore. I mean, unless it's a string sign, um, you know, I, um, it's, um, and, you know, I like to do what's called primary standing, where I put a stent and, and deploy it and, stand and balloon it. Uh, you want to always post uh, dilate um, and then uh, take pictures, make sure there's no filling defect in the filter, no spasm, uh, and then take out your filter and take a couple more pictures uh, and do find an angiogram. Um, there's going to be a variety of catheters, wires that you're going to be using. Honestly, I've right now I use a glide, I use a glide wire, angle glide wire, and then actually I learned something from Silva. You know, I used, I used to get a heart attack every time before the Simmons catheters in the arch. Uh, the way that you have to rotate them, push them forward, push them back, man, I'm like, especially you have these calcified arch, I'm like, you know, is, you know trying to talk to the patient, are you okay? You know, really uh, nerve-wracking. So I actually, because of him, now I use a glide catheter, believe it or not, it's atraumatic, four French, and also working with the new interventional radiology, do something similar to it called the DAV, and they actually pass the catheters in the arch without any wire, they just pass it, go from one, one, one bed to the other, and it's a very atraumatic tip. Uh, so a lot of things, you learn a lot from this case. So eventually you'll choose whatever you like, um, you know, but like I said, usually just stiff glide wire is enough. Sometimes you might have to put like a rosin in the external crowd out to give you more support or an amplats a few times, uh, which, you know, could be also some nerve wracking a little bit uh, to put your sheath up. Uh, but again, if you're going to use that to put your sheath off, that means you're facing a lot of tortuosity. So you have to be very, very careful. Uh, and sometimes you might have to like body wire uh, but that means you have to put a bigger sheath, the body wire, you know, um, uh, let's say keep a wire in an external 
and uh, put your filter up um, in the internal to to do, to do your stent. So. Um, Let's see. So these are different catheters. Like over over the years, you'd basically choose yours, uh, the one that you like the most. Um, um, I use uh, instead of Simmons. Actually, I use uh, quite a bit of the uh, JB1 or JB2, depending on the angle to get into the arch. It, it, you don't have to like push forward and rotate and pull back to form it. It's it's easier to form. Um, so first, you know, you know, do um, um, uh, arch uh, arch angiogram. Like I said, if we have I have have a CAT scan, I usually don't do it anymore. I just go straight to the cannulation and and the procedure. But typically, when we do like 30, 40 LAO, uh, you know, want to include all the origin of the vessels, and then if you if you can see the tarsal lesion at the same time, you want know, also turn the patient's head um, uh, uh, to get the best optimal view. Um, and look at your carotid lesion. So again, I'm not gonna go through all the stuff. You'll have it online, so you can look at all the different uh, different branches. Um, <clears throat> we pretty much talked about that. Um, again, you wanna take uh, take a picture, you wanna do a delayed picture, look at your venous phase, to make sure you don't have any, you know, arterial venous malformations. Um, also, you know, if you see there's any like filling defect, that means you probably embolize, um, uh, you know, at the end of the case. Usually what we like to do is bring the images pre and post, um, you know, different AP and, and cross table and compare the two uh, injections just to make sure we didn't embolize somewhere. Even though the patient's awake and you're talking to them, but still it's, it's a good practice. Uh, and Dr. I talked about these, uh, you know, different branches. I'm not, I'm not going to go over them into your cerebral and cerebral. But again, if you're going to be doing this procedure, you want to know at least quite a bit to impress in your interventional guys. Otherwise, you're going to be, you're just a joker, you know, doing the stents and, and leaving. So, um, uh, again, we talked about how putting, you want to put your catheter up uh, in the common carotid artery, usually like just a few centimeters above the clavicle uh, for support. Um, now, how are you going to identify the lesion as you go? The, you put your stand, you can do road map, uh, you can do overlay, or so if you want, when you're first starting these procedures, you want to really nail it. Is you put a seven French instead of six cents because it's easier to push contrast through it while the stand is sitting there in the lesion, so you can make sure you're going to get it. Honestly, if you're using a, uh, like, let's say, a wall stand, you're probably going to get it. Usually, they, I mean, it's a long stand, it's going to, uh, you know, even though it's going to fall short, but most, most times you're going to cover the lesion. The ones that you're going to use is if you're going to use a taper stent, you want to make sure that you're, you're on, on, on the lesion uh, when you deploy it. And again, um, uh, you want to make sure that you avoid the turns in the carotid artery. You want to make sure you put your filter in a nice, long, healthy segment in the, uh, in the internal carotid artery. Um, let's see what else. So these are some of the filters. Um, so pretty much I use the, either the Easy Filter uh, by Boston Scientific or the Spider Filter. Um, and they come in different sizes, so if you have someone with a small ICA or if you're doing a vertebral, which I'll talk a little bit about then, if I have time, probably not, is that, you know, you can get the coronary filters, which is smaller, because unless you want to put a big filter in a small vessel and cause dissections, that's one of the, one of the complications. Uh, like I said, I don't predilate, but if you're going to predilate, choose a small balloon, like a four millimeter balloon. All you want to do is just open that channel a little bit so the stent can pass. Um, um, let's see. Um, you know, oversized just stand by one to two millimeter. Uh, whether you use the taper or not taper stand, that's up to you. Sometimes also depends on the lesion. Um, and again, you, most times you're going to be what we call jailing the external carotid artery. You're going to go from the ICA to the common carotid artery. You want to make sure that you're well opposed in the common carotid artery. That's, that's because you're always opposed in the ICA, right? It's smaller, but you want to make sure that you open up and against the common carotid artery. Um, uh, let's see. Um, so, some of the, like I said, some of the, once you take your filter out, well, first take pictures, make sure there's no filling defect in, in your filter. If there is, you know, maybe you want to put a catheter up, try to suck some of that stuff out before you take it out, because as you're, you know, collapsing it into, into your retrieval system, you might embolize. So, we're going to do that. And then once you take it out, take one more picture and make sure there's no dissection. Spasm uh, also could be problematic. So, I always have actually nitro in the field, right? Because when this happens, you know, you don't want to like wait for the nurse to say, give me nitro. Okay, then they're going to like, how much you need? Why, how much are you going to dilute it? So, I usually have anesthesia, I have atropine ready. I usually have, I usually have nitro on, the, on my field in case I need it. There's spasm, it's ready available to inject it. Uh, and I usually stop giving prophylactic atropine. So I usually only give it unless the patient becomes bradycardic, usually you know, after, ballo after ballooning the, uh, the, uh, the bulb. Um, 
uh, we talked about. So this is just some some pictures. Uh, let's see. Oh, you see nothing there. That's interesting. Are they showing? Oh, there you go. Okay. So, I mean, this is like, for example, just to show you that like this actually we injected here just to make sure that we're, we're happy, we're aligned. You can see your filter is up here. Uh, I mean, you can inject through a six French, but it's going to be a struggle. You want to make sure you don't also uh, push in some air. So it's better to put like a seven French. Um, and then this is another case. And this is the filter up here. This is an easy filter. And this is a stenting. So real quick with the, with the vertebral stenting, uh, probably do a couple, maybe one or two a year, not, not as many. But again, if you if you if, if you're embolizing, this, you know, from the from the uh, vertebral, then you probably need to you know, fix it. Now, if you have a stenosis in one of the vertebral, right, it's not a big deal because usually, typically, most two vertebrals will join into the basal. So usually, one side is not going to cause this hemodynamic issue. So, uh, but usually, if it's if it's uh, embolic or you have you know contralateral side is you know atrophic and now you have high grade in the vertebral and they have some vertebral basilar uh, insufficiency, then you probably want to try to um, uh, fix it. So now instead of putting the sheath in the cardi, you put the sheath in the subclavian. Sometimes you might need another uh, body wire going all the way out into the arm to kind of for extra support and another wire into the uh, vert. And then uh, and I usually use a filter if I'm if I'm stenting the vertebral if I can. Uh, the last case we tried to pass the filter was very tight. We couldn't. So we end up just uh, st uh, ballooning and stenting without a filter. But usually I use a coronary uh, filter for the vertebral if I'm, if I'm doing it. Um, so again, Dr. I talked about the V1, V2, V3, and the V4 segment. Um, and uh, I have a few pictures. Um, again, you're going to use a small stance, usually short, like 17 long stance, usually uh, a couple millimeters um, uh, in diameter. Again, this is a, one thing I find really difficult in the, in the vertebral is just finding the right angle. You really have to give, you give yourself a very acu uh, acute cr uh, 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 cranial usually either cranial, call the more, most likely cranial uh, uh, view, and an oblique view to really find the origin of the vert. It's one of the most difficult. Uh, so you have to take multiple uh, injections and views. But this is before. This is just uh, angioplasty, and I think this was after stenting. 